Welcome back. Now I want to explain you an axiomatic description of a homology theory. And these axioms, called the eilenberg steenrod axioms, are really all we need to do actual computations. So we will never compute with the definition of singular homology as a chain complex. And as we have seen, this singular chain complex is a gigantic chain complex um, consisting of three abelian groups of, in, in general, uncountable rank. So this is something we try to avoid in actual computations to deal with the definitions. And it turns out, although it takes some experience and, um, and practice uh, to see how you can use the axioms I'm going to describe for um, computations, it turns out that these are really all we need. And um, it was the topologist Albrecht Dold who once said that if you want to compute singular homology with uh, the definition, so via the definition of a chain complex as the homology of the singular chain complex, this would be like computing a Riemann integral with Riemann sums, something that you usually don't do. So what are the eilenberg steenrod axioms? And they consist of a lot of data. And I will slowly walk you through this definition. A homology theory, and this is a bit more general than a uh, single homology theory, so. with values in R modules. consists of the following data. So it consists of a family of functors and these functors go from the category that uh, Holger introduced in the last video, this uh, category of pairs of spaces. Remember, the objects are just pairs, x, x comma a, where a is a subspace of x. And the maps are maps that um, restrict to the subspaces. And hn is a functor from this to r modules. So in, in Holger's last video, he constructed singular homology um, of pairs and they would be such a functor. Okay? They would constitute such a family of functors. Um, in that specific case, the way Holger defined it, R was equal to Z, so these were just abelian groups. Yeah, Z modules are the same thing as abelian groups. Like C really modules on are the, the same. The categories yeah. are isomorphic, not only equivalent, isomorphic. Okay, one word of caution. So in this definition, um, it's one of the few times where we say something about general homology theories. For the rest of this course, we will almost exclusively deal with singular homology theory and therefore almost exclusively use the symbol HN for the singular homology groups. But here, this is a more general setup and HN is homology theory in the sense I'm going to define now. So H star stands for this family of functors. What is the D stars? The D stars are natural transformations. Well, since it's been a while, maybe we want to remind people what, what this means in this particular case. Yeah, it means something very concrete. Let me first write it down and then explicitly say, because that's not the way uh, I'm remembering the definition. Um, but let's state it in a formal way at least once. So let me finish this where J 
to make it worse is another functor, is the functor from top two to itself that sends a pair x comma a to a the empty set. Well, and on morphisms, the, the functor does the, the obvious. Um, if you have a map of pairs of spaces, then it maps, it, it sends this map to the restriction of the map to the subspaces. But such that, just to finish that sentence, such that the following axioms hold. Okay, so this is the data, and now I'm going to describe the, the properties. But what does the data mean, okay? So I, I think we're, we're good with the meaning of a family of functors from top two to R modules, but what does this family of natural transformations actually mean? It means the following. So it means that, let me write this in blue. It means that, um, if you have x comma a, then there is this map to hn minus one of a. And let's introduce, as for singular homology we did in the last video, let's introduce in general, um, for general homology theories, the notation that hn x simply is HNX empty set, okay? So we, we defined formally these functors on pairs, but if we have just one space, it means relative to the empty set. And then this family of natural transformations gives you, for each pair of spaces, it gives you this map, HNX A to HN minus one A, but it is also natural in the pair, meaning if you have another pair of spaces, YB, and you have a map of pairs of spaces, so meaning you have a map from X to Y that restricts to a map from A to B, then first of all, this map F induces maps between these homology groups because HN is a functor. And also here. And DN is a natural transformation, just means that for any such situation where you have such a map, pairs of spaces, you get commutative diagrams like that, okay? And this is how you should remember this, um, this so-called boundary homomorphisms. Be careful, don't mix it up with boundary homomorphisms that uh, Holger defined in the last lecture. Um, the relationship will be clearer at a later stage. Um, but uh, this is what you should remember, somehow this diagram. And now this is the data. And now we have to uh, discuss the axioms, the ironberg steenroth axioms. So the first is the homotopy invariance. So if you have a functor from the category of topological spaces to abelian groups or to the category of R modules, homotopy invariance means that homotopic maps are sent via the functor to the same map. And here something similar holds. We just have to explain what do we mean by a homotopy between um, pairs, of, uh, between maps of pairs of spaces. So if f and g, and these are 
maps of pairs of spaces. Homotopic maps of pairs of spaces. And I will say what it means. Are homotopic maps of pairs And by the way, um, if I say map, and I have a map between topological spaces, and I don't see anything else, I mean a continuous map. That's a um, standing assumption. So what I mean is, there is a homotopy H, um, product to y such that, well, at time 0, it is just the map f, at time 1, it is the map g, and at all times, the subspace A is mapped to B. This is a homotopy uh, of maps of pairs of spaces. If you're in that situation, then the induced map by the functors Hn are the same. So these are maps from Hn x comma a to Hn y comma b. And this is true for all n. So if A is the empty subspace, then this property is familiar from the fundamental group. It's exactly the same property. As Say again, if A, is the if A is the empty set, so if we're only considering an absolute space, then this property is familiar from the fundamental group. That's also true if you have two homotopic maps of spaces, they will induce the same group homomorphism via the fundamental group functor. Exactly. And if, maybe even better, if A and B are points, Ah, that's then this is better. a pointed homotopy. Yes, that's yeah. even better. And then it's the same. All right, so this is the first axiom. The second axiom is the long exact sequence. Let's discuss this. This is probably less familiar. Well, I probably is not familiar at all, to be honest. Let's abbreviate this with LES, long exact sequence. And it says that for every pair, x comma a, so a being a subspace of x, the sequence of R modules And it's a long sequence, so it's an infinite sequence. Dot, dot, dot. Let's start writing it here at h n plus 1 x comma a. Then there is this map d n plus 1 um, that we have from the data of homology theory to h n of a, which is the same by our convention as hn of a comma empty set. Then there is a map to hnx, which is induced by a map i, which is just the inclusion. Write it down in a second. And then we go by a map called j, or the induced map by j, which is also just an inclusion to hnx comma a, and then it repeats then it goes down to hn minus 1 of a and so on. And the statement is that, well, first of all, I said it, but um, I should also write it, where i 
is the inclusion. So as a map of pairs of spaces, it's this map. And J is also an inclusion, but now it's an inclusion from X. It's inclusion, it's the identity <laughs> uh, on X. So this sequence of R modules is exact. And what do I mean by exact? So exact means that at any location in this long exact sequence, at any R module in this long exact sequence, so say here, the kernel, the kernel of this map here, uh, maybe you can see it better here, the kernel of this map equals the image of the preceding map. And this is true at any spot. Okay, so the kernel of this map is the same as the image of this map. So let me write it um, in at least semi formal notation. So you have this long exact sequence, and the dots are the modules, the arrows here are the the maps, the maps between these R modules, and the kernel of the map here at any spot is equal to the image here. So in semi-formal notation, we have this at any spot. Mm -hmm. So that's more than what we had in the case of chain complexes. There we only had the image was contained in the kernel, and this time exactness means equality. Right. Now it's good that you mentioned that. Okay. L let me just say it again. Chain complex is defined. The defining property is sequence of R modules with connecting homomorphisms such that um, the composition of two is zero, meaning exactly what you said, that the image is always contained in the uh, kernel of the, uh, of the next homomorphism. And if you take the homology of a chain complex, it is therefore a measure of the deviation um, from being exact. And if you just for, for the fun of it, consider this as a chain complex and take its homology, it would, would be zero. Mm -hmm. All right, that's the long exact sequence. Um, it in a, in, a, in a certain way, um, and this will be at this point probably hard to, to understand, um, but in a certain way it, um, in, in a weak way I should say, it relates the homology of uh, HN of A and the relative homology to the homology of X. And I think at this point it also becomes clear why we require that boundary maps be natural transformations because what one wants is that a morphism in top two, so a map of spaces, induces a map of long exact sequences. Yes. And so you, you do get you a communitive ladder of these exactly. two long exact sequences. And we already see that we get this for two of the three s recurring squares that will occur because just we have this commutative square of spaces then, yes? Because this IN homomorphism will give a commutative square with any morphism which would now go in vertical ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the same for the J, but there's sort of then one square remaining that you want also want to be commutative, and this is precisely what naturality of the boundary map yeah, that's expresses. The, the fact that it's a functor, the boundary map. Oh, sorry. No, a natural transformation. I thought you meant this square here. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah that's, the, that's the functoriality of HN, exactly. and the other is the natural naturality of the yes. S, you're right. And okay, so maybe um, I, I just said it that in a weak sense, um, you can compute HNX from HNA and HNXA. Uh, let's maybe look at this point at a uh, very specific examples where you can see that you can say something 
very concrete. So for example, what you immediately get from this um, easy consequence, let's call it, So if these HNIs say the inclusion induce isomorphisms, then I claim that all these relative groups here, they're all zero. And why are they zero? So HNI is supposed to be an isomorphism, and this means that the image is everything, but the image equals the kernel of HNIJ. So the kernel is everything, meaning that H and J is the zero map, the trivial map. And uh, in a similar way, you argue that this natural transformation here, this DN, is the zero map. Why? Well, we have to show that its image is zero, but its image equals um, the kernel of the map that comes here. But all these maps induced by I are assumed to be an isomorphism. So it has to be the zero map as well. So you have that this is the zero map, this is the zero map, but this means that this module here is the zero module. Why? Because then um, its kernel is everything. Uh, sorry, no, the kernel of the zero map uh, is everything, but this is the zero map. So um, it's the e image which is zero. And so actually also the, the converse is true. Yeah? And also the converse is true. If you have zeros everywhere there, mm -hmm. you argue in the same way that these maps here and there are the zero maps. I mean, that's mm -hmm. obvious. And then um, it follows that these maps are uh, surjective if this is zero and you get the injectivity from this map being zero. So there are isomorphisms. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of consistent with the idea of what relative homology should be. Yeah? If you measure x relative to a subspace A, then the more A resembles x, yeah, yeah. then the, the, the nearer should h n x comma A be to zero. And this long exact sequences, sequence expresses exactly that. And Roman just discussed the extreme case. When they have the same homology, then the relative homology vanishes. So, so we have that. and. Maybe it's also good to state a specific case of, of this already specific statement. In particular, just from the axioms, you get that if you take the relative group xx, then this is zero. Something which was obvious for singular homology theory um, by definition. Um, but here, if you just have these axioms, you can conclude this. And of course, the point of the following lectures will be to prove that singular homology satisfies the axiom that we're uh, discussing right now. So this is the second axiom, but there is more. There is the excision axiom. And the excision axiom is a statement about a space X and two subspaces, so let x be a space and a b subspaces with the property that a lies in b but a bit more the closure of a even lies in the interior of b. And then the inclusion of pairs and which inclusion you will see in a moment. It's the inclusion of the pair x minus a, b minus a into x comma p, x comma b. So this inclusion induces a map and this map is an isomorphism. This is the statement of this excision. For all n. And this is also maybe a bit mysterious if you see it for the first time. So the role of this excision 
uh, statement is really to compute the homology of a space, so in combination, I should say, with long exact sequence, the excision um, statement or axiom gives you a way to compute the homology of a space from easier pieces from which the space is built. And again, we will see this in, in a clearer way at a later stage. Um, for now, it's maybe instructive to just look at the following very, very easy application of excision, which is, let's again in blue, which is the case where x is a topological sum of x1 and x2. And we take this x2 as B and also as A in the application of the excision. Okay, since it's a topological sum, um, the interior of B is equal to B and the closure of A is then equal to A. So the assumption of excision is satisfied. And if we apply it, then we get that Hn of x comma x2 which is B, is the same. And now we excise the A, which is B itself, which is equal to X2. So what's left over is X1. And here, the empty set. And we can skip the empty set in the notation. So the relative homology of a topological sum relative to one of its summand is just the homology of the other summand. So, and now, you can plug in this information back into the long exact sequence. So in the long exact sequence, there were three different kinds of groups. L let us bring it up here. So the relative group, the group, the subspace, and the homology group of the total space. Now, in that situation, x relative to x2 is just the homology of x1. So we have the homology of x2, the homo sorry, the homology of x1, the homology of x2 and the homology of x. And therefore, the long exact sequence relates the homology of x to the homology of x1 and x2. And in fact, as we will see a bit later, you can from now with, with a few additional steps um, easily conclude that the homology of x is actually the sum, so the direct sum of the homology of x1 and x2. So in that way, the combination of long exact sequence and excision, and we will see again, this see much clearer uh, later, gives you a way to compute homology from pieces of a space. And then one also sees that it's important to have this condition that the closure is contained in the interior because for general unions, this will not be true. Yeah, it was important that it's a disjunct union. Yeah. yeah. And maybe another remark, um, we commented in the first video that um, homotopy groups, if you recall, are exceptionally difficult to calculate. And I think it's fair to say that the reason for this is that for homotopy groups, one does not have this excision property. And this right. is what makes homology computable. You, yeah. Exactly. There is no way, in, there's no algorithmic way to compute homotopy groups of a mm -hmm. nice space, say a CW complex from mm -hmm inductively um, um, or somehow step by step from its skeleton. Mm -hmm. That's true. All right, so if you have an additional uh, axiom, you say that the homology theory satisfies the dimension axiom. And this is the last of the axioms I'm going to present, or it's the last axiom that we, that we have. So if the homology theory in addition satisfies the requirement that if you compute the homology of a point, oh yes, oh, well, let's write like this. So this is the one point space. Oh. Easier than what I wanted to write is zero for all n not equal to zero. If you have this, then we say 
that the homology theory satisfies the dimension axiom. see that the homology of the single homology of a point is just z in degree zero and all the others are zero. So single homology will satisfy, uh, apart from all the other axioms, it will satisfy the dimension axiom and it will be the main homology theory that we're studying in this course. And our goal for the next lectures is to get used to this maybe at first sight strange set of axioms and to learn to understand how to use just these axioms and not the definition to do actual computations of single homology groups.